Okay, so just tip fixing a typo. So we've got passing by value and we've got calling C from Fortran. So because of this interface, we now call the C functions from Fortran. So from the uh, module tensorlib c.f90 in the subroutines init mem, so let's have a look at init mem. Uh, in init mem, we are calling the c function uh, using c alloc. Now we've got c alloc, so we're we're um, we've got uh, we. So we're calling the C function C alloc, and we are passing into C alloc an integer of type uh, C size T. So remember that um, this function requires an integer of kind C size T to be passed into, uh, into the C function. And so we use this casting function int so there is casting functions. So you can use um, int or real to cast um, or, or change um, from one variable type to another. So in this instance, we change an int to an int. Um, so we change an int of kind four, which is um, actually, this will be, um, this is where, this is where the compilers are different. <laughs> so, in G Fortran, in G Fortran, the result of the size of operator, and uh, the size of intrinsic function, automatically returns an integer of type C size T. But on the Cray compiler, on Satonix, so the Cray compiler, this size of operator returns an integer. So we need to be sure that um, it is int of kind C size T. So you use this cast here, not cast, but you know, this, um, this function int to change um, whatever's inside here to kind C size T. Um, okay, so we do that. So we call C alloc and what is returned is a pointer called temp C pointer. So we've got temp C pointer here. And that is a type C pointer. And that is going to, we're going to use that again and again. And we're going to use that again and again and um, to do allocations of memory. Now there's this function here called um, call CF pointer. And this is really cool. So what is returned from C alloc? is uh, a pointer of type C pointer. So this C alloc function um, returns a pointer of type C pointer. Now, the return data type is of type C pointer. So we can convert this pointer to a Fortran pointer using the CF pointer subroutine. So, so within the ISO C binding module, there is this really cool function called CF pointer. And what that does is that takes in a C pointer of type C pointer. So that takes in the C pointer and associates the memory or converts not converts, but associated a memory that is allocated to that C pointer. It associates that with a Fortran pointer of different types. You can have different types of Fortran pointer here. You can have pointers, Fortran pointers to ints, Fortran pointers to reals. But in this section here, you can describe the shape of the allocation, so the shape of the pointer. So if you've got a 2D, if you've got a 2D pointer, for example, this could be in in over two by two, for example. So you could have that in there in this shape. 
um, that is um, so this this bit here um, in the last the third argument to CF pointer and that is the shape of um, of what you are that is the shape of the Fortran pointer that you are point or associating with the C pointer. So that's how you get this really nifty function is how you cross the bridge between um, C pointers and Fortran pointers. So this CF pointer is pretty cool. So it can almost do like a pointer re or it does can do a pointer remapping in the sense that um, you can have high dimensional pointers and then specify their shape. And you can associate that with a, with a memory allocation that was constructed by a, um, a C pointer. So this is how we do our, um, our memory allocations in C and then pass them back to Fortran. And then we're growing Fortran arrays around those pointers, around those pointers. And so we're growing these, these Fortran, um, uh, well, Fortran pointers, but now they're functioning like arrays um, around, around these pointers. So that's in the init mem module. Now you might be a little concerned about this overwriting of the temp C pointer, um, but that is okay because now the memory that is associated with this pointer can now be accessed through the Fortran pointer. So we can recover, we can recover this void pointer from the um, from the Fortran pointer. So we can go the other direction. So we've gone, we've used the CF pointer subroutine to go from C pointers to Fortran pointers, but there is another function called CLOC, which goes from Fortran pointers or Fortran locations back to C pointers. So, so this is crossing the bridge one way, and now let's cross the bridge the other way. So let's cross the bridge back. So the function, the subroutine launch kernel here, um, that calls the function launch C kernel from C functions dot CPP. Okay, so this launch C kernel, um, that calls this C, this C function here. And inside this launch C kernel, we are launching the, well, we're launching this function C kernel at every point um, in the uh, rank one tensor. Okay, so, so we're doing that, but we need to pass into launch C kernel, we need to pass in pointers and in this module, we've got the Fortran pointers, A, H, B, H, and C, H. Now, we have defined them as being kind is equal to real 32. So real 32 actually comes from the ISO Fortran environment module, but we could have also used, um, and when we're working with C code, it's probably better to do this instead. We could have used the C float kind. It's the same sort of um, thing on this architecture, um, but uh, but just uh, for this instance, I think we've uh, we've just used the real thirty two type, the real thirty two kind. Um, okay, so launching this. When it comes time to call the C function launch C kernel, we use the C loc function here. So the C loc function, what that does is that gets the um, pointer associated with the starting address of the memory allocation pointed to by AH. So that's what that means. And um, you could actually get, 
the void pointer pointing to any part of that array, for example, by doing this. So that would get the C location, so the void pointer that points to memory that begins at um, element three of AH. So that's how to extract, or that's how to make a uh, type C pointer, um, a type C pointer from a memory location in Fortran. So you can do this C loc, you can do this for pointers, but you can also do this for things like allocatable arrays, but they need to have the target attribute set. So let's just say, for example, that I was defining a um, or passing in an allocatable array. Um, I would need to have the target attribute set as well um, on the array. So dimension that and then target um, the H, for example. So I'd need to have this target attribute set in order to use CLOC. Um, now, I'm not entirely sure why that is. It's just that's what the compiler wants. Uh, you need to have that target attribute set on the thing that you are using CLOC on. So CLOC, um, yep, grabs that. Now, by default, pointers have the target attribute set by the looks of things. And so this CLOC works with Fortran pointers. So we could have done this. Yes, go ahead, Alexis. Yeah, Toby, I'm sorry. Um, when you mentioned that uh, we can pass the third element, so I guess this is going to be complicated because that's third element in Fortran, mm -hmm. Fortran organization, isn't it? So it's... Yes, that's right. Yep, so that is going to be element number three. So element, uh... element at index um, three. Now, normally Fortran is... Um, ones, so it starts at one, so that would be one, two, three. That would be the third element. Yeah, but it also it also moves differently than than C, like it moves mm -hmm. column wise. Um, rather that's than... right. Yep, that's right. You have to be aware if you're going to pass if you're going to pass um, a Fortran array to a C function, you're going to have to be a aware that it's column major. Now, we're used to doing things as row major in C. So that means mm -hmm. the array is contiguous along the last dimension of your array. So you need to be cautious that if you are passing a pointer to a Fortran thing, um, it is going to be contiguous along the first dimension of your Fortran array. Yeah. And that's okay. okay. That's okay because in the C function, then you can just um, construct um, offsets using um, using a stride vector that is constructed for column major ordering. So it uh, it is fine. Yeah, but you do have to be aware of that. So yes, that is a that is a good point, Alexis. Thank you. Okay, so the pointer returned in this or this is the same. However, the, it is a potential source of a bug because what happens if I had defined, um, what happens if I had defined here that it was going to be, um, that the array AH was going to start at zero instead of one. So um, this is a potential source of a bug. And in fact, I've been called out by this 
um, in the other work that I am doing. I've been caught out by this bug. So if this works, this seems to be safer um, in, in, my, in my thinking. Um, okay, so when it comes time to freeing that memory, we can use CLOC again. So we can use CLOC again to get the starting address of the memory that is uh, pointed to by the Fortran pointer. So then that now is, we, we've got that and we're passing that into the cfree function and we are then freeing up the memory. Okay, so now let's compile this using the GNU compilers. So we've got our um, we've got our our G plus plus we've got G plus plus which we need to compile the C plus plus function, and we need um, we need G Fortran um, we need G Fortran to compile our Fortran code. So I don't know why the G got taken off there, but um, all right. So let's do this. So we've got our terminal open and we've got our, our functions here. We've got our C++ functions. So let's compile that using G++. So we're going to copy that. And that's going to become our object file. So we're compiling using G++. We're using the compile option to compile our C code and we're creating an object file called C functions. So we do that. The next step is we compile the module library. Um, so this is tensorlib. Uh, this will be tensorlib. I think this should be tensorlib C. Yes, this should be tensorlib C.f90. So I have made an error there. So tensorlib C. Okay, so we need to compile tensorlib C. And hopefully this should work. Yes, that's great. So we've compiled our tensorlib C. So we've compiled our module. Now, when we compile our module, you will notice that there is a mod file. So there's a mod file here called tensorlib.mod. Now that is the same name, that is the same name as the module, not the source file. So this tensorlib.mod is a module file that needs to be in the include path when you are compiling the main program. Now these module files are created in the course of building modules and they are required um, before you compile um, the main program. So they are required to be in the include path. And the thing is too, is that um, modules are compiler specific. So module files that are compiled in the course of compile, sorry, that are generated in the course of compiling a module file, that is specific to a compiler. And this means that if you are going to compile a program where you have dependencies, all of those dependencies that rely on Fortran must be compiled with the same compiler as the compiler that you are using to generate the program. So this is a bit of a pain when it comes to administering Fortran software, all of your dependencies that provide Fortran interfaces 
must be compiled with the same compiler. Okay, so we have now compiled our TensorLib C module, and now we're going to compile the Tensor Add C fun. So Tensor Add C fun. I don't think we've seen this file, so we should we should have a look at that. So Tensor Add C fun is the um, the Fortran file. Uh, just let's have a look at Tensor Add C fun. So it works pretty much as what we've seen before. So from TensorLib, we're going to import um, init mem as alloc mem. We're going to import free mem, launch kernel, ah and bh. So it's the same thing as before. We've got some variables. We call alloc mem. Um, we fill the memory with random numbers. We call our launch kernel. And then we call free mem to release resources. So I'm just going to now compile. Um, so let's compile this file. So G4 trend tensor add C fun. So I'm just going to compile that. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of object files now. So we've got our object files. And now the reason why this worked is because when you do compiling in the same directory, um, it automatically adds that directory, the same directory into the include path. So that's why TensorLib mod was picked up. So now we're going to link all these files together. So we're going to link all the object files together. And we are going to create the tensor add executable. And we are going to run the tensor add executable where we have used C code to on the back end to allocate and deallocate the memory. Um, so I've got uh, I've got some I've got this cell here which builds the tensor add C fun and runs it. So that uses the CMake build system to do this. Okay, so that is the end. We've come to the end of um, the teaching module for the Fortran Refresher. So congratulations on getting to the end. Um, do we have any questions or comments surrounding that? Uh, I have one question, Toby. Yeah. So, so you mentioned we could uh, use a different type of, um, I think you were using real 32 and we could use- Yes. Yeah, but, that's right. But that that doesn't avoid us to use the C log and the CF um, no, no, functions, isn't it? So no, no, we that so, doesn't stop us. So that that would be more like a, I don't know for uh, your comment was like because we are, were going to use C, it was more common sense to use that type rather than the other one or yeah yeah that's right well i know on this architecture that c float um and float they are four byte you know they they are four byte um data types but mm. so this is where you have to be consistent uh so if i uh, go back to sharing my screen I'll go back to sharing my screen here. Okay, so if we have a look in C functions, I've done this type def. So I've done type def float as float type. And in tensorlib C, I have done this. So the Fortran pointers that point to this memory allocation, um, the kind is real 32. Now I know that I know that real 32 is compatible byte for byte with um, you know yeah compatible byte for byte um, with float on this architecture. 
but this is this is where when I'm putting this program together, I need to be sure. <laughs> so I need to be sure. So a better choice, a better choice would be would be C flute. Yeah, so a better choice for that would be C flute. So now, now I need to now be sure that this kind equals to C float is equal to this here. So if I made that double, right? If I made that double, then I would have to change, I would have to change that to C double. So you would um you would then you would then need to make sure you could you could use macros for example to make sure that these are consistent across these files. So you need to ensure that um, that these two are the same. Otherwise, otherwise, if I, you know, otherwise you can see that there'll be problems if I try and um wrap a Fortran pointer to real of kind um C double um to an allocation of type C float. That would be a disaster. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Can you use in Fortran something like the type def? And then you obviously you need to um, check both, yes, both well, you could, files. Yeah. You could have probably, um, it could be useful yeah, in, to have the equivalent of the type def at the top, and then yeah, you only check you, those lines. That's right. If you have a look in Fortran best practices, there is a way of defining in a module all the different data types for float, um, for example, for float and int. And then you can be consistent across everything inside mm -hmm. your Fortran code. So, ha so have a look at the Fortran best practices. There is ways to do that. And then you could have some way, some corresponding way in here, um, cut some corresponding way in here um, to set that, yeah. to set the right uh, number of bytes or to set the, the, right, the right pointer type. <laughs> But yes, yeah, so what I'm trying to say is you need to be consistent with precision when working in C and Fortran. So you need to be consistent. Yeah. yeah. And the other, well, my other question is it's again the same the same thing. You already mentioned it, but uh, your example is um tensor addition. But if it were mm. if it was multiplication, then we we need to be super careful with the C function, isn't it? Because yeah, C on the yeah. C side we're going to be receiving transpose matrices from the mm -hmm. C point of view, and That's we cannot right. do a normal multiplication, I guess. Well, well, the thing is though that you're working, yeah. Um, if you are working with um, stride vectors. So if, if you're thinking in terms of stride vectors, um, so a stride vector is just a vector containing the strides in each dimension. Um, in your C code, you just have to be aware that the stride in dimension zero is one, and then the stride in, you know, and construct your other strides accordingly. Okay, so but, that's the common practice, like the functions in C, in your C functions, Use yeah. stride striding. Okay. Yeah, that's that's right. So that would be a fairly simple way, but then you would have to ensure that in your C code, you of course stride over dimension zero in your innermost loop. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it will be a lot slower than you expected. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. No worries. Yeah, are there any other questions or comments?